Morning Summit, Pastor Ryan here. We're so thankful that you chose to tune in with us today. And, and I'm personally excited and thankful for another opportunity to gather together as the church, though virtually, maybe in microgroups, in our homes, or even individually, all across Pierce County to proclaim the beauties of the gospel through song and prayer and in time in God's word. So no matter how you joined us this morning, no matter how you feel about God or about yourself, our God is unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And and thankfully, His love and His care for you and for me is unwavering. So as we do every week, I want you to hear now the welcome of the gospel, a welcome that I need as much today, and I'm sure each and every one of you need it as well. To all who are weary and need rest, To all who mourn and need comfort that only a risen and empathetic Savior can give. To all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares. To all who fail and desire strength. To all who sin and sin and sin again and need a Savior that gives total grace in Christ. This church opened wide her arms to you with a welcome from Jesus Christ. He's the ally of his enemies, the defender of the guilty. He's the justifier of the inexcusable, the friend of sinners. And because all of these things are true, we know that this message to us this morning from Jesus is to come. So let's take a deep breath, let's lean in, and let's freely worship our Savior together today. Welcome. Good morning, church. Sing with us.
come to you boldly today into your presence, Lord, because, because of your spilt blood, or because you cleansed our sins, or because of your righteousness that has been credited to our account. But what an unbelievable reality that we can see and know and live as your sons and daughters because of your sacrifice, Jesus. And so even with, with stammering tongues, Lord, with words that lack the majesty and the honor that you deserve, Lord, we still sing of your power to save. And we ask by your word and by your spirit working in our lives today, Lord, Lord that our affections might all the more be for you and nothing else. How thankful we are to gather today by your grace and for your glory. Or would you work in us, we pray. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. Good morning, church. We miss you all. Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 through 17. Hear now the word of the Lord. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the sign of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, We brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, O oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to be beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Sorry, one moment. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In early 2015, there was a great divide that occurred in the court of American public opinion. The divide was widespread. There were dogmatic opinions on both sides of the divide. Arguments sprung up, even within the same household. Things were tense around this issue, and the divide wasn't around sports rivalries, it, it wasn't around political parties, it wasn't around socioeconomic issues. The divide occurred over the color of a dress. Now, if you are on social media, if you're on the internet, if you, if you were at least five years ago, then you have probably seen this image. The question is, what color is it? Is it white and gold or is it black and blue? What color is this dress? Now, what's crazy is that, that people look at this image and some people like me see clearly, undoubtedly, that the dress is white and gold. Other people, for the life of them, cannot see the dress as white and gold. All they see is black and blue. Other people, maybe those lucky few, depending on when they look at the picture, how they look at it, have actually seen both colors at different times. The question is, why? Well, there is a scientific answer to that, and it has to do with the way that our brains process information. 
You see, our brains are these incredible computers, but they, they actually depend massively on assumptions that we make about what we're looking at. Without us even realizing it, our, our brains are constantly filling in information that we're not actually seeing when we look at an image like this. Like, is it day or night in the picture? Where is the light coming from? Where are the shadows coming from? We're, we're asking these questions. And so what happens is that, that the information that we actually see end up, ends up getting processed. It gets fed through the synapses in our brain through assumptions. It gets filtered through information and experiences that our brain has saved and logged all from the past to the point where then they've actually done studies on this a person will actually see this image differently depending on whether they are a morning person or a night person depending on the rhythms of light in that they see in the course of their life now here's the point the point is that it is completely possible for us to to look at something and get stuck in this feedback loop, this loop where, where we can only see one thing and it's almost impossible for us to actually look at an image like this from a different perspective and see something else. And what ends up happening is that we actually miss the truth of what's actually there. And that's true not just about the way that we see color, that's true about the way that we see other things in life as well. We know this, right? This is our human experience. We, we come into situations, maybe we're confronted with a new person or we're confronted with a new situation and, and we interpret reality based on a set of assumptions that we have, assumptions that are rooted in our experience, that are, are rooted in our biases, those shape how we perceive things. Now, if that's true for what we, what we look at, what we see, and how we understand it, and how we perceive or misperceive it, how much more is that true for the way that we see and understand and perceive or misperceive the person of Jesus? In Matthew 16, Jesus asks the most important question that you will ever answer. How do you see me? Verse 15, he asks it literally this way. He says, who do you say that I am? In other words, Jesus is asking, when you look at me, what do you see? And your answer to that question will affect everything about you. It'll affect everything about life for you. Now, this passage that we're in this morning, it actually tells us three stories. And, and through these three stories, we, we really see two distinct ways for us to just miss Jesus. And then we see in the third story what it looks like for us to actually get Jesus. And so what I want to do this morning is just simply unpack this passage in that order through that grid. So make sure you got your Bibles. Let's open them together. Matthew chapter 16. Here, here's the first way that we can miss Jesus. We, we see it here actually in the first section in verses 1 to 4. Why don't you read it with me? And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Now remember, Jesus, just for a little bit of context, Jesus has been traveling through the northern region of Galilee. He's been preaching and teaching. He's been healing and delivering, and his fame is spreading. And so this isn't the first time that the religious leaders have come to him. In fact, as we move forward in this gospel, we're, we're going to see on this road toward the cross increasing conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders. And so this isn't the first time that they come to him, and neither is it the first time that these leaders come to him and demand from him a sign. In fact, we see a very similar episode. We saw it just a few weeks ago in chapter 12. The difference here is in who actually comes to him. Look at verse 1 again. It's the Pharisees and the Sadducees together. Now, if you were watching this scene unfold as a first century Jew, to see these two groups come together on anything would have shocked you. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, of course, they, they were these two prominent religious leadership groups in first century Israel. The, the Pharisees, as you know, were really the religious conservatives of the day. They, they, they prioritized obedience to God's law. They, they were separatists from Rome, and 
they were really made up of the people. In many ways, they were this populist movement, and their driving motivation was was really that if Israel put God first again, if, if Israel got back on God's good side, then God would make Israel great again. That's the Pharisees. The Sadducees, on the other hand, they were really the, the liberal progressives of their, of their day. They were made up uh, more of the wealthy class. They were theologically liberal. They weren't as tied to the oral traditions and the, the interpretation of the law that the Pharisees were. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the full authority of Scripture. And they didn't feel really any need for revolution as a nation in order to, to gain national freedom and independence. They saw partnership with Rome as really the way forward for their country. And so to see these two parties come together on anything would have been a rare sight. It would have been like seeing Republicans and Democrats partner together to pass legislation. But the very fact that these two groups are united against Jesus shows us something. It shows us that skepticism and antagonism and animosity toward Jesus, these are bipartisan issues. And they, can't, they can really just as easily come from the right as from the left. They can just as easily come from religious people as from non-religious people. And so these leaders come to Jesus, the text says, to, to test him. To ask him to show them a sign from heaven, a sign really to prove that he is who he says he is. They they want him to do something that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. Now question, is this a genuine, heartfelt inquiry? Not at all. What do they want? Well, their hope is to expose Jesus and prove him wrong so that they don't have to deal with him and they can go on really happily with the status quo of their lives. But Jesus here turns the tables on them and he responds in a way that only Jesus can. Isn't this always Jesus' way? He flips the focus and turns the spotlight on to them. Look at verse 2 with me. He answered them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Now, we have a modern version of this little proverb that Jesus tells here. You might have heard it before, red sky at night. Sailors delight, red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. Now in 2020, we live in a world where if I want to know what's coming up for weather, I very easily just pick up my phone, open an app, and I can see hour by hour what the weather is going to be for the next several days. News flash for you, that was not the way it was 2,000 years ago. And so if you were a farmer or if you were a fisherman, if you were a shepherd or if you were a sailor, your livelihood, I mean, not to mention your life, it it would be dependent on on knowing really what weather was coming down the pipe. You would have to learn to read the signs in the sky. And so what's Jesus saying here? He's really saying to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, hey, you guys can read the skies, but you can't read the times. You're able to look up at this this red sky at sunset, and you know that it's going to be a great day tomorrow, and you wake up and you look at this very same color red in the sky in the morning, and you know that bad weather is coming. You're able to look at these things and see and understand and perceive. And so the, the issue for you in not understanding me, not seeing me, it's not that you're not smart enough. But somehow you, you look at me and you don't see and understand and perceive. And so the, the issue, Jesus says, isn't that you can't see the signs. It's that you don't want to. Jesus here is exposing in them and he's exposing in us something in our human condition. It's the same issue that we have with seeing the color of the dress. 
You see, there have been no lack of signs for these leaders. In fact, at the end of chapter 15, if you, if you look back there, we see Jesus here healing and delivering the crowds. And in chapter 15, verse 31, Matthew says that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking and the cripple healed and the lame walking and the blind seeing, and they, they glorified the God of Israel. And, and so these crowds, just a chapter ago, these very average very needy people, they got it. They looked at these signs and they saw and they perceived and they understood. But these religious leaders, they, they look at Jesus, and, and really this is what we do as humans, isn't it? It's, it's totally possible for you to look at Jesus. And because of your biases and your bents, because of your assumptions and your idols, because of your experiences with the church or with Christians or with the Bible, because you went through this or that hardship and you, you wondered where God was in the midst of that, it, because, because of all of these things, what you look to to make you happy or successful or, or make life fulfilling, because of this load of different assumptions and preconditions that you bring to the table when you look at Jesus, you, you can't see straight. And so it's possible for you to, to miss the signs that are right in front of you and not see Jesus for who he really is, to just miss him. And you might say to him, like, Jesus, show me a sign. Like, I will believe in you if you get me this job. Like, Jesus, I will trust you if you fix my marriage. Like, Jesus, I will, I will follow you if you get me out of debt. But but let me tell you what that often really is. It's like these religious leaders were doing. You want Jesus to come and jump through your hoops. And Jesus says, the sign that you need is not me doing some miracle in your life. In fact, if I did that, you probably wouldn't believe anyway that what you need is to look at the miracle that I've already done. Look at verse 4. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Now, I'm not going to go into all of this in detail. I talked about this a couple weeks ago when we were in chapter 12 and looked at Jesus saying something very similar. But you remember the Old Testament story of Jonah, right? Jonah was, was swallowed by this great fish. He descended into the depths, really descended into death. And God saved him. God raised him up. And this fish ends up spitting him out. And Jesus is saying, that is me. I am going to go and I'm going to be swallowed by death. I'm going to descend into the depths, into death, and then I'm going to be raised to life. And Jesus is saying, that's the sign that you need to look to. That, it's that good news, that, that miraculous sign of my death for sin and my resurrection and victory over death. That is what you need to look to. Look, friends, the, the, the resurrection is the greatest proof of who Jesus is. In fact, Paul says that, that Christianity really rises and falls with that reality. It, and so if you are coming this morning to Jesus as a skeptic, look there. L look at how this Jesus in history died a, a brutal and bloody death on a Roman cross and was literally physically raised to life three days later. That's the heart of Christianity. That's the sign that Jesus points us to. Now at Summit, we, we love skeptics and seekers. We, we welcome intellectual inquiry and questions and, and really thinking about who Jesus is and what he's done and wrestling with all of that. We're, we're glad if you're tuning in this morning and you are not a Christian. You're just finding out what this is all about. We so welcome that. But let me tell you, if you are coming to Jesus, if, if, if you're seeking Jesus, is, is really just a way for you to check the box and scratch Jesus off of your list and move on. If your mind, when you come to this, is already made up and you, you aren't willing to come to Jesus with some type of existential humility knowing that it's possible that you have it wrong and, and you're unwilling to wrestle with your assumptions and your, your preconceptions, Jesus will leave you to that path. 
He does that here with the religious leaders. Look at the end of this paragraph. Matthew says these sad words here. So Jesus left them and departed. They missed Jesus. And this is one way for us to miss him through, through just a closed-minded stubbornness that's unwilling to see him for who he is. Now here's the second way in this text that we see we can miss Jesus. It's here in this second paragraph in verses 5 to 12. This is, this is such a great story. Jesus leaves this scene that we just saw and he gets into the boat with his disciples and they go to the other side of the lake. And when they get there, the disciples realize something. They've forgotten the bread. Look at verse 5. When the disciples reached the other side, they, they'd forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, Jesus uses this moment, like Jesus always does, as a chance to really teach his disciples something. They've just gone through this encounter that all of them have seen with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And, and Jesus says, he says to them, hey, watch out for these religious leaders. Watch out for their teaching. If you're not careful, their approach in your life will be like this leaven, this negative influence that will come in and will seep into every crack and cranny of your life and create destruction. Jesus is, is really warning us. I could preach a whole sermon on this. He's warning us how r religiosity, how religion as an idol is always something that we need to watch out for. Jesus is trying to teach his disciples this. But look at what happens in verse 7. They completely miss what Jesus is saying. Verse 7, they began discussing it among themselves, saying, we brought no bread. This has got to be one of the funniest stories in the Gospels. Je Jesus is helping them to understand some profound truth, and they are like Winnie the Pooh with his stomach growling. <laughs> Did someone say, honey? Right, their, their, their minds are consumed with what is immediately right in front of them. They're thinking about their own stomachs. And they, they, they think that Jesus is too. They're, they're wondering, like, is, is Jesus mad at us about the bread? Is this passive aggressive on his part? I'm hungry. We're hungry. He's probably hungry. Where are we going to get food? What are we going to do? They're wondering this. And so in, in all of this myopic focus on food, they, they totally miss what Jesus is saying, and they, they can't hear and understand what his point is, what he's getting at. Look, there is a way for us to miss Jesus just by being antagonistic toward him. There's a way to miss him because you're, you're skeptical, because you don't really want to see him for who he is. But there is also a way to miss Jesus that isn't hostile, that isn't combative, that isn't cynical. It's possible for you to miss Jesus when he's right beside you simply because your eyes are more on your felt needs than on him. And one of the most common things in, in our household, if, if you're currently a parent, then you might get the same thing in your household, or we maybe are just totally failing as parents, but this happens so regularly in our home. We get to about 5 o'clock, 5.30, my wife is in the kitchen cooking dinner, and one of our kids come in complaining, I'm hungry. And as a parent, you're like, look, look, lift up your eyes and look, Dinner is right on the stove. We're about to put it on the table. Like, we're not going to forget about you. You are going to be fed. But their eyes are so consumed with what they feel in that moment that they're totally unaware of what's going on around them. They're consumed with what they don't have, what, with what their felt needs are. That, that's where the disciples are. And that's also often where we are. And so even as a follower of Jesus, it's easy for us to start looking at our life, to, to start filtering how we perceive things, to start filtering how we perceive Jesus through our lack, through what we don't have, through our anxiety and our worry and our fear. We become so fixated on these questions. How am I going to make it through retirement? Now, how are we going to pay the bills next month? Or are my kids going to succeed? Are we ever going to be able to buy a house? How am I ever going to get married? What, what am I going to do about my health? These are the questions that consume us. 
And what's going on isn't this active belief, active unbelief that we see in the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's more of just a, a passive distrust of Jesus and his provision. He's right there beside us, and yet we can't see him. We can't understand him. We, we miss him because our eyes are focused down here on ourselves. And here's Jesus' response in verse 8. O oh, you of little faith. By the way, whenever Jesus says this to his disciples, it's never Jesus lambasting them or insulting them for not believing. This is actually a unique word that only Jesus uses in the New Testament, and it's actually Jesus lovingly teasing them. And so he says to them, O oh, oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? And don't you see the color of the dress yet? Don't you remember the, the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets were gathered or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets were gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? And Jesus is saying to them, don't, don't you remember the miracles? I mean, you, you were with me. You were, you were there with me when I took this tiny offering that you had and I fed 5,000 people with it and there were leftovers. You you were there when I took the almost nothing that you had and I fed these 4,000 people and there were leftovers. You were there. You, you saw it. Do you remember that we, we had more than enough? And don't you see who I am? I, I am the one who feeds his people. I'm, I'm the one who provides and, and I'm going to provide for you. Look, as soon as our eyes start looking at ourselves and our own resources, our need, our lack, we get these blinders on and we so easily miss what Jesus is trying to say to us, what Jesus wants to do in us. And it's easy for us, you know, to read a story like this and just beat up on the disciples. I mean, like, how can they be so thick? How can they have been there for these feeding miracles and, and see Jesus' provision, and in the very next story, totally miss Jesus. But this is so us. We, we fixate on our problems and our lack, and it's just a recipe for us missing Jesus and what he wants to teach us. But he's saying to us, if, if you would just get your eyes up off of yourself, you, you'd be freed up to actually see and hear me. And so there's two ways here for us to miss Jesus. One is through this hardened skepticism and cynicism. One is simply turning inward, turning our eyes toward ourselves in, in, in such a way that we forget that Jesus is right there beside us. But what I want you to see here is, is that Jesus is much more patient with one of those ways of missing him than the other. You see, Jesus here doesn't give up on these disciples. Look, look at what he says to them again here in verse 11. He says, How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He repeats himself. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Je Jesus presses in. He presses toward them. And they finally see it. They finally get it. They finally perceive. They can finally hear what he wants them to hear. Well, we've seen these two ways to miss Jesus. What I want you to see next is what it looks like when we actually get him. And I want to end here. Look with me at verse 13. Now Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, right? We remember this from a couple weeks ago. That's what Herod thought Jesus was. John the Baptist raised from the dead. And so some were saying John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus really here is, is pointing to himself and he's asking his disciples, what do people see when they look at me? How do they perceive me? And, and we, we've seen this over and over again in Matthew's gospel. There, there are all of these ideas floating around about who Jesus is. And 2,000 years later, nothing has changed. There are people out there who look at Jesus and they see him as 
a great moral teacher. There are others who see him as a prophet. There are others who see him as someone who's full of wisdom or a political revolutionary. There are others who see him as crazy or even a myth. There are all kinds of viewpoints out there about who this Jesus is. And all of those are shaped often by our assumptions, by our preconceptions, by what we actually want Jesus to be. But then Jesus here asks the question that really matters. Verse 15, by by the way, this is the question that the entire gospel of Matthew swings on. Everything that comes before and everything that comes after hinges on this question. But who do you say that I am. When you look at me, Jesus says, what do you see? And Peter, who's never slow to speak, pipes up, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the Messiah, he says. That's what Christ means, by the way. Christ isn't Jesus' last name. This is actually his title. It means anointed one. It's the very same thing that the word Messiah means. He's the anointed king. He's the promised savior. He's the eternal son of God. Peter sees. Right? In this moment, all of Peter's assumptions that he's brought to the table, all of his preconceptions, all of Peter's experiences up until this point, all of his tendencies, all of his, his barriers to belief, all of his misperceptions, all of those things in this moment are, are stripped away and he sees Jesus clearly. He gets him. He understands. Now, how does that happen? Well, there's a hint to how it happens here in what Jesus says in verse 17. Blessed are you, Jesus says, Simon bar Jonah, Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. There's a couple commentators who help us understand what Jesus means when he says this this phrase, blessed are you. He's really saying to Peter, congratulations, you get it. Another pastor says that what Jesus says here could be translated into our modern English, you lucky duck. (laughs) You lucky duck, Peter. You you understand. You you get it. Congratulations. You, You see what all kinds of other people have missed. But you know, if you you read the gospel accounts, it's pretty clear that the reason that Peter gets this in this moment doesn't have to do with Peter's smarts or his brilliance or his education or his, his incredible insight that suddenly causes him to see. In fact, that phrase, congratulations, you, you lucky duck, you, you get it. It reminds me of those old commercials in the 80s for Publishers Clearinghouse, right? Where you, you remember Publishers Clearinghouse? Right, where, where they would just show up at someone's door and they'd open it and they would just hand them this check, this big massive check for millions of dollars. Congratulations, you lucky duck. You are the winner. You didn't do anything. You just stumbled into this and you are now rich. Congratulations, you lucky duck, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter getting it, this is 100% God's gracious work in him to open his eyes to what's actually been there all along. I wonder this morning what your answer to this question is. When you look at Jesus, what do you see? Are you, are you just missing him? Maybe in you there's this growing skepticism and cynicism around the edges of your life because Jesus hasn't proved himself to you in the ways that you want him to. And you, you actually don't want Jesus to be who he says he is. You want to move on with the status quo of your life. Or maybe you've been missing him simply because you're focused on your felt needs and, and not on the fact that Jesus has been with you the entire time. Look, most of us, no matter how hard and how long we we look at the dress, we were not going to see it in any other way. We're not going to see it in any other color than we did at first. But here in this text, Jesus actually says to us that, that there is something that we can look at 
And through the work of the Spirit, through the Father's work in us, looking at this reality has the power to actually change our perception about Jesus. It's the one sign that Jesus points to in this passage. It's the good news of his death and resurrection. Jesus says here that if we will look at the cross and the empty tomb, if we'll, if we'll look at that over and over and over again, when, when we stare at that, do you know what happens? Slowly, almost really miraculously through the work of the Father and the Spirit, all of our old perceptions, all of our preconceptions and assumptions, all the way that we've seen things up to this point start to fall away. And the glory and the grace and the kindness and the mercy of Jesus actually become more and more clear to us. You know, that's why we come every week to the Lord's table. Because through the Lord's table, we actually get to look at this sign of Jonah that Jesus is talking about. We, we get to look at Jesus' atoning death for us and his resurrection that, that saves us. We, we look there over and over and over again, and we actually see clearly again. We're going to, in a moment, sing and partake of the table together. But, but as we do, I want to encourage you this morning to turn your eyes toward the sign that Jesus points to. Turn your eyes toward him. We've failed him a thousand times, and yet his mercy remains. We stumble over and over again, and yet his, his grace remains meets us and what we're wanting to do is learn the art of losing ourselves of getting our eyes off of ourselves and our felt needs and up to Jesus to lose ourselves in bringing praise to the everlasting one to the Christ the son of the living God church let's sing together well, church, as we continue in our singing together this morning, let's ask the Lord, let's ask Jesus to help us see him more clearly as we declare these truths together. Here we go. Do you sing of his mercy with us? A thousand times I feel Still your mercy remains Should I stumble again Still I'm caught in your grace Everlasting Your light will shine when all else fades Never ending Your glory goes beyond
Friends, as we come to the table, we, we come to these symbols of bread and juice or wine, and we remember the reality that this Savior, this Christ, this Son of God came and lived the life that we should have lived, died the death that we deserved, and rose again victorious over death. And we really believe that if we, by faith, come to this table over and over again, God pours out His grace, His transforming grace to cause us to see the reality of things, to see what's really real in clearer and clearer ways. And so if you're a Christian this morning, if you've trusted in Jesus' death, for you, then this table is for you. We want to encourage you, whether you're by yourself in your home, whether you're with your micro group or with your family, take some time in a moment to meditate on the realities of what Jesus has done for you. Then pray together, then partake together of this meal. This meal that reminds us of the lavish, abundant grace of God to us in Christ. Church, we really miss you. But we, we're trusting that during this time of COVID, when we're separated, when we're doing this digitally, we believe that the Spirit of God is doing all kinds of good in you through His Word, through worship, as you gather in community, those of you that are in micro groups. What, what a blessing this is for us to lean in during this time and hear what Jesus wants to say to us. I want to encourage you. I know the summers are busy for all of us, but I want to invite you that if you're not plugged into a micro group yet, this is a great chance for you to do that. We're going to be at least a few more weeks meeting as micro groups. Let us know that you're interested in getting connected. You can do that on the Regather page on our website or by emailing us at info at summit-christian.org. 
Just a couple of other things. We had a phenomenal Sunday Night Live on the lawn last Sunday. We're gonna be having another one coming up this Sunday, August 16th, 5 p.m. Bring your family, bring your picnic blanket, your picnic dinner, come as we worship, spend time around the Word, and actually see one another physically. Also, if you are interested in prayer, we're gonna be having prayer on the lawn for several weeks coming up until the sun starts going down too early. Seven o'clock, Wednesday nights, come on out to the church. We're gonna gather and we're gonna seek the Lord together. But church, as you go out, you're going out as light into all of the places that you live, work, and play, bringing the name and the glory and the renown of Jesus into those places. Receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go out into your week in peace.